Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to our holiday cooking program presented by Ben Nims. He's the cooking columnist for the LA Times, and we're just delighted that he is presenting this for us today. I'm sure a lot of you take the LA Times, and you are probably familiar on Sunday with that wonderful food section. Um, so I'm going to talk about, and just we have a lot of people joining right now, and so we'll let everyone in. But in order to um, have wonderful opportunity to listen to the program, if you could please um, mute yourself. And um, also we are going to be recording the program. So it's on YouTube Pasadena Library that you can tell your friends to look at it afterwards and you can as well. Also, um, we have the um, recording um, that you can um, live chat if you need to do that. You need to put that on your own um, computer to get that going. We um, will have chat and in chat, you can put questions in there. And Ben has agreed to chat with us about everything. What kind of a substitute you might want to use, where you can find something, um, something probably a secret recipe that you forget or something, but he is just a source of wonderful information for all of us about cooking. So think of all of those special cooking questions that you have, put them in chat, and after the program, the end of the program, Ben will answer those questions. So as I started off with, we're delighted that Ben is here today talking to us about holiday cooking. He's the cooking columnist for the Los Angeles Times. He has written three cookbooks and we have some of them, have some of them to show to you today. And they're in the Pasadena library that you can check out. One is Air Fryer every day. And the other one is sweet and Southern classic desserts with a twist. And these are available for you to check out from the Pasadena Public Library. If you would like to purchase them, they are also at Romans Pasadena for you to purchase. Um, he has worked as a food editor at um, the Los Angeles Times for the past three years. He's a recipe developer for several food media publications, such as Lucky Peach, Food and Wine, Savior, um, Savour, BuzzFeed Tasty. He's born and raised in Mississippi, and I read somewhere that he spends his weekend stocking his freezer with biscuits and making fruit jam. And boy, we would like to be invited over, wouldn't we, uh, to, sample, to sample some of those. That would be wonderful. So those of you that take the Sunday Times, um, there is that wonderful um, food section. And so I have the one that came out on um, December the 5th, and it's holiday cookies and um, wonderful recipes in here. And the one that was in the LA Times yesterday is um, tradition oh, twist with an extravagant. Well, it's really traditional holiday cooking with an extravagant twist. So uh, be sure and check these out. You can also go to one of our branch libraries and um, get a copy of the LA Times so that you can read. And also it's available on the internet as well. So um, welcome, Ben. Thank you so much for coming today and presenting this wonderful program for us. Welcome, Ben. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Thank you for having me. Um, I was going to say, if I don't know answers to questions later on, I can pull one of these books and look it up really quickly using uh, my um, Dewey Decimal System in my brain for how everything's organized. <laughs> um, <laughs> lots yeah, of so I wanted to, lots of cookbooks yes. there. <laughs> I do know where they all are though, even behind me. So it's, it's good to know. Um, yes, thank you for having me. Um, you know, I love talking about anything and everything cooking and I'm happy to always chat with everyone about, you know, what they want, what they want to cook, what, you know, what they want to inspire them um, for cooking, not just the holiday time, but all year round. Um, ingredients they're interested in, techniques they want to try out for the first time, things like that. So I'm always, um, I love kind of a back and forth um, presentation. So I'm always, I'm very happy to 
answer your questions. Uh, would love to, uh, you know, answer as many of those as you have um, later on. But uh, yeah, for now, I would just want to talk kind of about, um, as Christine said, you know, holiday and baking tips that I have. Um, a lot of stuff that I've learned uh, with the past two months worth of stories that Christine held up, the cookies and uh, the Christmas menu that we just put out on Sunday. Um, I think it's a lot of um, maybe helpful things that will, you know, can uh, I think a lot of people who email me and write to me with questions all the time, that some common things are uh, questions that they have um, for recipes uh, from our readership. And I'm sure you might have the same questions as well. So I kind of just wanted to go down the list of the kind of things that, um, you know, I think might be pertinent at this time of year for holiday cooking and baking. Um, one of the ones that, you know, I think um, is probably the most uh, pressing for this time of year, especially in COVID and last year is just making less food. Um, you know, I think probably like a lot of you, I was planning to have a bigger gathering, uh, more people um, for Christmas this year, kind of like I did for Thanksgiving. And now we're all kind of having to go smaller again, um, you know, if you want to, just because of everything that's happening. And so I get a lot of people asking about, you know, how do I make um, smaller versions of dishes I already make, what are some great ideas for just things to cook that, uh, you know, um, take up less space um, or just, or they're easier to cook for just two people and you don't have a lot of leftovers. Um, and one of my things that I always say is, you know, the easiest way to do it, especially if you're someone who really likes to cook and you really have, you know, your family recipes or the, your favorites kind of down, you have them memorized and you love making them, is to, if you're going to have less people, make the same amount of food, but then split it up between two smaller dishes um, and either freeze that second dish or give it away to someone that you know um, would need it. Um, you know, this year I have friends who, you know, because of they might, you know, have been exposed recently to, a vi to the virus or they're, you know, not going home because they're scared to go see their family um, again for the second year. They're just staying home and they're staying home by themselves. And for me, you know, because I like to cook and because I like to make a lot of food, I'm planning to make all the food I would normally make if I was going to have them over to my house, but then just like bring them the extra that I make. Um, it can be leftovers, but it's also kind of nice to, you know, be given, you know, a fully you know, formed uh, like a casserole or like a side of like mashed potatoes or some kind of something like that or a nice salad, um, all kind of ready to go, like not all fully made, but just like, you know, stick this in the oven for 30 minutes at 350 and here you have a great meal, like a chicken pot pie situation or, you know, mix this together and here's a salad. So kind of like ready-made meals, um, I think are really kind of generous and nice idea to give to people um, in the holidays right now. Um, it's better than just cookies, although cookies are wonderful, and I'll get to that in a minute. Um, but I think, you know, giving people full meals um, where you can control the food, um, I think it's a really nice thing to do for the holidays. It's, I think now more than ever, a lot of people are in need of that. And it's a little, um, it's a little probably easier to take on than trying to, you know, um, go to like uh, volunteer at a homeless shelter or feed people on the street and that kind of thing, which can be kind of overwhelming for a lot of people if you've never done it before, but just to feed your friends and people who you know their tastes and you know um, what it would mean to them. I think that's a really good thing to do. Um, so I always do that. Um, I even have a few things in the freezer um, right now, freezing. One of them is uh, the biscuits that Christine mentioned, um, you know, this time of year, like I, I take everything that has a lot of uh, butter in it. And so I make a big batch of biscuits, stick them in the freezer. And then once they're frozen, I put like two, um, each in like little Ziploc sandwich bags. Um, and I write on, you know, 425 for 25 minutes. That way people can have, you know, uh, hot biscuits in the morning whenever they wake up and they're just like, you know, usually it's always the day after Christmas and the next day after when you're still, you know, not in your same routine and you're like, oh, I want to go somewhere for breakfast. But I have nothing but, you know, holiday food. What can I do? And it's like, oh yeah, I've biscuits in my freezer. So you can do that. You can do, um, you know, hand someone, um, you know, a bag of a couple of slices of toast or something that you made or a really nice bread with like a jar of jam. Um, you can make people, you know, waffles and freeze them and then show them how to reheat them. I like giving food gifts like that for the holidays. Um, again, just because I think there's, everyone has a lot of sweets laying around and those are wonderful to give to. And I do that myself, but it's also, nice to remember uh, the savory side of things and like breakfast is something that always people forget about. Um, 
I know a lot of people who don't eat breakfast at all, so which is very foreign to me and strange. So they might not need it. But for someone like me who wakes up ravenous, um, I always appreciate having some kind of like, you know, nice hot uh, breakfast um, in the morning, no matter if it's the holidays or not. So those are the kind of food gifts that I like to give. Um, and so, and that is also going off on how to make things smaller for yourself and for other people is just to make the food you normally do, but just split it up. Uh, so that's what I would do, you know, if you can at all do that for sure. Um, and then there's other things, you know, like I had someone, so for the Christmas menu that I did yesterday, I did a porchetta uh, because I was planning to have a lot of people over, uh, like 12 people over to uh, my closest friends to kind of like help me eat it. But now that's not going to happen. Um, and so a lot of people are like, can I cut this in half? You know, it's a lot of meat for just me or you know my, my family of four. And I was telling the, um, the reader that, you know, certain things like a porchetta, which is, you know, this um, big, you know, uh, pork loin that has like pork belly wrapped around it. So it's kind of like, as big as like two footballs, you know, if you cut it in half, then you kind of have something that is almost like tire shaped and it's supposed to cook all like if the tire was standing up. And so it might just be a little weird. It might not cook uh, in quite the right way that it should if it was a longer piece. Um, and I think a lot of, you know, uh, you know, big standing rib roasts, um, like leg of lamb, all these like big kind of like big format meats that a lot of people make for the holidays. They don't really work when you try to do smaller pieces because, you know, if you're going to, it's going to take such a long time, you might as well make a lot of it. Um, I know a lot of people, you know, if you are following my first piece of advice would be to make the full amount and then, you know, freeze, give away as much as possible, having, you know, um, you know, leftover chopped braised meat in the freezer, you know, to make a pasta sometime or to make soup or that kind of thing. It's always great, especially, you know, uh, with the weather being like this, actually cold for once um, and prolonged cold and rainy weather. It's nice to have braised meat in the freezer to make those kind of dishes whenever you don't feel like going to the grocery and to have something always um, in your pantry ready to go like that. So I would say, you know, make these things like that. But if you really just don't want to, you know, roast a big piece of meat or um, stuff like that, then I would say go for smaller things that still feel kind of special um and maybe are a little bit cheaper although they might be a little more expensive depending on where you go um and that's things you know like uh steaks or you know pork chops or like duck breasts and things like that things that you know can you might normally get at a restaurant i know i normally get that kind of stuff at a restaurant um but if you cook it for yourself at home it can be really nice you know i think just because the holidays it doesn't um necessarily have to be the same types of food like it does at thanksgiving you know it can be you know, just anything that you like that feels special. Um, I know a lot of friends who they, you know, they, they get caviar and they just like, eat that with potato chips and, you know, and blinis and champagne. That's their whole, whole meal. So you can do stuff like that. Do like kind of out of the box uh, things um, for the holidays that aren't the same um, uh, old dishes that you normally do. I kind of like the traditional stuff too. So I try to stay in that world and maybe um, switch it up a little bit. Um, I also think that, you know, um, during the holidays, um, you know, if you are cooking, I know a lot of people or more people are doing vegetarian and vegan. That's always something that, you know, it's kind of hard in the holidays because I think so much of Thanksgiving meals, Christmas meals, not so much New Year's because that's, um, that's a different thing, but are so based around these like, big grand pieces of meat because you want something that, again, feels really special. Um, I think the for me, the way to go with doing like vegetarian and vegan kind of main dishes um, is, you know, you can do like a roast head of cauliflower or um, I've seen one time I roasted, um, someone had gotten like a maitake mushroom that just was as big as uh, someone's head. And, um, and they roasted that with like oil and salt and pepper um, and like a nice sauce. So I think that doing things like that, um, you can do like big vegetables, but also kind of, Doing a cuisine that you normally wouldn't um, that you normally wouldn't cook for the holidays, I think, is a really nice way to kind of like switch it up. So if you have you're feeding people who are vegan or vegetarian, you you're, you're like, okay, I have all these vegetables. What am I going to do? How am I going to make this like a special feeling uh, meal that's you know not just like a piece of meat you know roasted and sat in the middle of the table? Then do like you know um, uh, some kind of like curry, or do like um, like an Indian roast dish, or uh, do something, you know, um, kind of like a stir fry. Can, there can be 
um, other dishes that still feel special because they're using special ingredients, like really nice mushrooms um, and things like that. Or, you know, if you want to go the truffle pasta route, but you can, there's always ways to, it doesn't have to be like a roast situation. You can do all these different dishes to kind of make things feel really special. Um, so I think that's one thing that you can definitely do. Um, also for reducing the amount of dishes for, uh, you know, smaller gatherings and things like that for the holidays. I think that well, my biggest piece of advice if you're, when it comes to like cookies and like desserts and things like that is, is that if you want to, um, you know, reduce the amount of cookies that you're making, um, which I think is always kind of a great idea because I feel like no one really wants more than about two dozen cookies, even if you're sharing them just because that's a lot of cookies um, to eat. But I always say, um, go buy the amount of eggs in the, in the batter or in the cookie dough, because that's the hardest thing to, you know, cut in half or cut in thirds or cut in quarters. So if, you know, if the recipe calls for three eggs, you can cut it in thirds to use that one egg, but I would go no less than that. Um, just because again, everything else, you can kind of do the math on and kind of round it out if you need to, to um, still make things work out. And cookies are good for that reason because they're not baked in, you know, specific uh, size pans or like molds and like that, you know, they're just individual pieces that will, if you make 10 or if you make a hundred, they're all going to bake at the same time, you know, as long as you have the right proportions of the dough and everything like that. So um, that's kind of, you know, some of my thoughts I have on reducing uh, the amount of dishes or uh, you know, making smaller batches of food for these smaller gatherings that we're all going to be having um, for the holidays. Um, another thing uh, that I often get questions on are substitutions, um, which is kind of my favorite thing to answer because um, it's, I thought I'm always surprised by um, what people think they can substitute for other things. Um, so I love hearing these things. And so that was kind of the uh, reason why I did the holiday cookies this year the way that I did. Um, and all the holiday cookies I did this year were either vegan or gluten-free. And that was because for the past couple of years when I would put cookies out in LA Times, I would do like one or two that fit those parameters. Um, but our chief recipe tester who works to me, she is gluten-free, she's celiac. And other friends who are too and who are vegan, they're always like, oh, do you have anything else that's not, uh, you know, that you know, we can eat? Um, and a sizable number of readers would also ask for mostly vegan cookies and gluten-free. And so I was like, you know what? Why don't, why don't we make um, all the cookies that way? And, uh, but also I want the cookies to feel special enough that anybody, no matter if you're vegan or gluten-free or whatever, you, you, know, you would love these cookies. You would not notice that they have anything you know, less than what a normal cookie would have, which is you know, just butter and eggs and things like that. So um, I said about making vegan and gluten-free cookies, um, again, for this reason. And I kind of developed the cookies using two uh, rubrics or one for each type. Um, and the gluten-free one was, you know, there are obviously lots of gluten-free um, baking mixes that exist now. And you can, um, you know, I think every time those get called for, people are like, you know, where can I find those? I don't, I don't know where. Gluten-free flour, what is that? But I, you know, I find, uh, you know, King Arthur makes uh, a, a style. Um, Bob's Red Mill, which is the most common thing ever, they make one and I can find those that, you know, the cheapest grocery store to the most high-end place have those things. So I think a lot of these ingredients that people think aren't um, accessible or might be new are actually in the grocery stores they can go to. It's just, um, you don't know where to look. So I always you know, ask, um, I always, I know a lot of people don't ask, um, you know, grocery store employees where things are. I always ask just because you never know where it is or they might have an ingredient you're looking for and it, you would think it'd be next to the chocolate, but it's next to the salsa randomly, you know, things like that. So always ask, these ingredients are, I think, more common and more commonly available than a lot of people think. Um, but for the gluten-free cookies, you know, there's a lot of these um, gluten-free flour blends that you can use, but I always like to um, use as few ingredients, as few specialty ingredients, um, or just what people already have around their home, or at least what I think what they would have, um, especially during the holidays. And I think if you're interested in gluten-free baking, uh, you're going to have like nut flours. So um, almond flour is the most common one. I feel like it's been used for, you know, well over 10 years at this point to make not just gluten-free um, baking, but all types of like 
old style like European baking uses mostly almond flour. Um, a lot of Italian American cookies and things use almond flour, almond paste and stuff like that. So it's a, it's an ingredient um, and it's a flavor profile that people are familiar with. So I like to start with something that people are really familiar with the most common thing and try to make cookies based around that. So all the gluten-free cookies I did used um, almond flour. I think one used hazelnut flour. Um, almond flour is the best because it has the most neutral flavor. Uh, I think that's why it's also used to make almond milk and things as well, because it just doesn't have a strong flavor to compete with anything else you're making. Um, but, you know, if you if you want to make like a chocolate hazelnut cookie that's gluten-free using hazelnut flour, best way to do that, of course. Um, there's coconut flours. There's even like pistachio flours and things like that. So there's um, ways and all, you know, nuts, I think, are a big ingredient when it comes to holiday baking, where they're making fruitcake or just any kind of like small nut cookies. Those are um, I think it's already a plus to use the flour of the nut that you want to be like the highlight of your cookie. So I kind of went that route in making the gluten-free cookies. Um, and so I, you know, I think, and a lot of the questions I always get is, I want to make this cookie gluten-free. Can I just substitute the uh, regular all-purpose flour for almond flour? And I would say that the quickest answer I can give is usually yes. However, it's just going to be a very different thing, uh, you know, because flour, regular all-purpose wheat flour, not only uh, does it have gluten, which you're missing, obviously, when you may use almond flour, but even the most like finely ground almond flours are going to be a little rougher in texture than uh, wheat flour. So everything's just going to be a little, um, little crunchier um, in terms of the way it looks. But usually, you know, uh, because you have eggs in there that will help bind it together, you won't really miss the gluten that much uh, from the, the wheat flour. Um, so I think you can pretty much get away with it, especially if it's a cookie, because again, it's going to be something that's going to have like a tablespoon mixed into the batter. Um, but when it comes to uh, like cakes and bigger things using almond flour, I would say not so much just because you're, you're at that point, you're using so much, you're uh, expecting the flour to kind of be the structure of the cake. But for cookies, I think it's great. Um, it's also one of those things where I think um, using nut flours is great for gluten-free cookies um, because, again, they give a little bit of structure, they give a little bit of crunch, they give flavor. Um, and again, you're using eggs, so you're going to have that binding agent. The hardest thing to do is gluten-free and vegan because I think without either eggs or flour, it's really hard to make something work well. And it kind of ends up tasting like a, um, like a power bar, like an energy bar. So um, I try not to do both, although I know there are people who need to do both. Um, that is not my area of expertise. And so maybe next year I'll tackle that. But this year I had to dip my toe into the water of, of doing these kind of alternative uh, baked goods. Um, and so the other one was vegan cookies. And so, the way that I approach vegan cookies instead of, um, which is almost the harder one because again, flours you can substitute, but eggs are really, you know, what we've built our entire American baking culture off of is using eggs. Um, and so when you don't have those, and they are very specific properties that they add, and it's really hard to substitute them. Um, so what I did was there is a bakery in New York uh, called Ovenly that I would go to all the time and I used to live there. And their just you know in-house chocolate chip cookie is naturally vegan. They don't they didn't set out to do it that way. Just it is what it is. Um, and so and what they do in their recipe, which is in their cookbook, is they take um, they substitute their eggs with uh, oil and water, and then they mix it with the sugar in the recipe, and they just like whisk it really vigorously. And what happens when you do that is it the sugar, water, oil it kind of emulsifies almost as if you're making a mayonnaise or a hollandaise type sauce, although not technically the same thing, but it still happens. And it just creates this like kind of um, like gel, for lack of a better word, looking a uh, goopy mixture that um, because you like kind of emulsify the oil and water with the sugar, it kind of stabilizes the dough for the cookie. And, you know, when you make the cookie dough, even though it might kind of, you know, when you're rolling it into a ball, it might kind of shear off in certain pieces, it, it mostly stays together. So I was like, you know, I know that works really well for, um, for that cookie. And I made that cookie so many times that I, you know, I feel like I have a grasp on it. So I kind of use that technique to then help me make 
the vegan cookies um, that I developed for the for the times. Um, and I would say that that is a really good, you know, again, this is me not looking at any recipes anyone's trying to substitute or to make vegan. But if you have a pretty base cookie, you know, like a sugar cookie or, uh, you know, a rollout cookie, you're going to like pipe frosting onto or just kind of, you know, a basic chocolate chip, maybe even a ginger molasses situation um, that has so many other ingredients. Um, I think you can kind of get away with substituting the uh, egg for water and oil because that's usually, I mean, besides the binding kind of, um, you know, the binding nature of eggs, that's mostly what they offer. They offer um, moisture and they offer some fat um, and a little bit of protein, but you know, you already get that with the flour. So what I do, uh, you know, a, a, a typical large egg, which is what we call for in our recipes is about a quarter cup, uh, you know, out of the shell. And then it's about, I would say one and a half tablespoons of that is the yolk. And then the other two and a half tablespoons is the white. So I think, um, you know, I can't quite remember the ratio they use in their chocolate chip cookie, but I would say that for every egg, if you, you know, that you need for your recipe, if you do a tablespoon and a half of vegetable oil, again, or, you know, avocado oil, sunflower seed oil, grape seed oil, anything kind of neutral um, flavored oil, and then you use two and a half tablespoons of water. And then uh, in your baking recipe, when it comes to the point where you usually would um, mix the sugar with the butter or oil, um, use that mixture instead. And I think that will get you some pretty good results. Again, nothing specific, but that's I've, I've used that. It's worked out pretty well um, in a pinch. Um, so that's kind of my, uh, you know, that's my substitution for that, um, for, for vegan cookies. I haven't, you know, again, there are egg replacers that are exist on the market. Um, but when I was developing the, the recipes for these cookies, I found that most of the egg substitutions really only work in like cakes and like baked goods like that. Um, yeah, because it's either, you know, you use an egg replacer uh, powder, which I've never used. So I'm not actually quite familiar with those at all. Or you use like uh, seltzer water or you use um, applesauce, like mashed banana, things that are great if you're making like a loaf cake or, you know, a layer cake or something like that, where that kind of the body um, and the density uh, and just the moisture that those things provide um, is really good. But for a cookie, you don't want unless you're making a cakey cookie, but who really likes those? You don't really want a lot of moisture or fluffiness. You want something that's going to be chewy or crispy or kind of thin um, or that will like kind of break kind of softly. It, those things kind of make things cakey. So that's why I found, I found that using water and oil really helps because it adds fat and adds moisture, but doesn't add um, kind of like a thick uh, texture to um, your cookies, I, you know, unless that is what you're going for. Um, and then another substitution that I was just talking about um, with Christine before everyone joined was um, I noticed recently um, that I you know, went shopping for all my baking supplies for this year to make um, cookies for everyone. And vanilla extract, regular McCormick vanilla extract is very, very expensive. Um, I think it was, I got like a two ounce bottle um, at my Albertsons grocery store and it was like $24, which is an insane amount of money to spend on vanilla extract. Um, I did not look at the price of the imitation stuff, but at that point I was, I should have, I should have bought it. Um, I've never proponent for that stuff, but in this case, I would say do that. But, you know, if you're, if you're ever wanting, you know, find yourself in that position, you're like, you know, the recipe calls for vanilla, you know, what am I going to do? What, what should I substitute for it? Um, I find, and again, you might not have this ingredient in your house as well, but if it's the holidays and you're like me, then you're going to have some bourbon lying around or whiskey. Um, I think those things work really well because uh, the flavor notes in vanilla, um, which is in the extract, um, are kind of this like caramelized, kind of woodsy, kind of dark um, flavor that it does add um, and also aromatic. And then it's also, it's, it's alcohol. So I think, you know, bourbon, whiskey, um, any kind of like, you could even use like dark rum, those kind of things that have that kind of caramelized sweetness to them, like um, aromas and notes, and then they're also alcohol. So that means that it will evaporate just like vanilla extract, but leave behind that kind of uh, warming spice flavor that you kind of want for most holiday cookies. Um, and, you know, again, bourbon is never, or booze always covers a multitude of sins. So I think that's a great substitution if you have it. Um, if you don't, 
then I would say find an extract that you do have maybe from 10, 20 years ago and just use that to see if it still tastes good. <laughs> uh, and kind of adjust your baking and your cookies around that. Um, so then, you know, while we're talking about cookies, I figured um, I would kind of talk about, you know, kind of the best types of cookies to make um, for the holidays. Um, you know, even though I just developed, you know, a lot of vegan gluten-free cookies for the paper and I'm very proud of them and I love them. I also found this year that, you know, the kind of things I want to eat the most, especially now that I've, you know, I do all my holiday baking and my kind of like holiday eating a month before the lay person because I have to develop it and have it um, shot and everything to be put into the paper before the actual holidays arrive. So, you know, I eat Thanksgiving in early October, I eat Christmas the week after Thanksgiving. So it's a little, it's a little um, off kilter, but uh, when it comes to cookies, uh, you know, I've already had all the cookies I want. So the things that I really want, I think that are the most successful is just really kind of classic, um, easy, easy cookies, you know, uh, things like the, um, the kind of the blossom cookies where it's a Hershey kiss kind of pressed into like a little peanut butter uh, dough, um, good old classic sugar cookies. Uh, you know, we went to a cookie holiday party um, last week and, you know, there's a cookie exchange where everyone got to bring their own cookies. Then everyone made tins of all the different types of cookies and you brought them home. And I found myself gravitating, gravitating towards all the sugar cookies that just had, you know, simple sprinkles on top, or they had, you know, peppermint extract in them instead of vanilla, um, or, you know, or like the little um, Mexican wedding cookies, uh, Russian wedding cookies, Viennese cookies, whatever you like to call them, that are kind of like ground nut and flour and lots of powdered sugar. Those really simple cookies, I think, um, they kind of make the most lasting impact. Um, I'm always a proponent of doing new fun things, um, especially I want everyone to always do that. So keeps my job going. Um, but I also think the simple things are really great too, especially when it comes um, to cookies. Um, and so I would say if you're looking for something to make for someone, I would say go the sugar cookie route. You know, it's really simple. Um, you can always, you know, use brown sugar instead of white sugar. And that gives you basically a chocolate chip cookie without chocolate chips. Um, you can also, the sugar cookie is a great canvas for different extracts. You know, if you can't find that vanilla, but you have, you know, orange extract or rum extract. I have one of those or coconut. Use one of those, makes a great cookie. And then you can kind of use whatever else you have. They're a great base for frosting if you want to do frosted cookies. Um, and I think sugar cookies are even great for making, you know, the types of, um, usually the cutout cookies you would make to frost are more like shortbread because they keep their edges. But if you have sugar cookies, you can roll them out, stamp them out. They'll be a little rounder on the edges, but they'll be nice and chewy and they can, you can frost those as well. I think those are really great because um, then you can also, you know, vary the types of sprinkles that you use, um, use chocolate chips or peanut butter chips or any kind of um, nuts that you want. It's just a great uh, all-purpose mix. -in. It's kind of like the yellow cake of, of cookies. And so um, I think those are always really fun um, to, to make for the holidays. If you're just like, you know, I want to make cookies either for myself or to give away, what should I make? Just go that route because you can, anything in your pantry, um, for the most part, you can mix into them. And they'll be really good. Um, I also think that especially if you're someone who's like, okay, I want to make cookies. I you know haven't done it before. I really hate the tedious task of having to like roll each one individually or whatever it is. Um, you can always make bar cookies. I think those are probably the easiest um, entry point for people because you know most of the time it involves kind of putting a dough into a pan. You can kind of use you know if you're kind of clumsy, you can use your brute force to kind of stamp the dough into the into the pan. You don't have to be super um, gentle with it. Um, some kind of filling that usually goes on top, but it bakes up as one unit and then you can cut it into like small pieces, big squares, do whatever. Um, and you always know the type of yield you're gonna get and you can make more if you need more. Um, so I think bar cookies are always a great way to go for that reason as well. Um, I like to make them. Um, some of my favorites are like, you know, instead of making like, a full pecan pie. If you're a type of person who eats pecan pie, you can make um, pecan pie like bar cookies. So it's like a lot of crust, a little bit of goo. Those are always really good. Um, I love um, like gooey butter cake. I don't know if anyone knows about that, but that's kind of, um, it's kind of like St. Louis Midwestern thing, but it's also I feel like gotten somewhat famous in the last couple of years, but it's basically um, kind of like a cakey um, bottom to a cookie. And it usually has some kind of like cream cheese um, or like kind of pumpkin filling on top, but it's more of like a, um, kind of like a soft dessert cookie. 
you can use for dessert or you can treat it as a cookie and do lots of powdered sugar and sprinkles and things like that. Um, so those are always really good. Um, so yeah, I would say bar cookies are a great way. You can also, the great thing about those is, you know, if you get a recipe and it calls for like a nine by 13, you're like, oh, all I have is, you know, uh, a loaf tin or a small like eight by eight uh, pan. You can usually um, split the recipe in half to fit into one of those um, and make smaller cookies um, that we usually bake at around the same rate. So again, bar cookies are just easier to um, cut in half or uh, decrease if you need to make less as well. Um, so now um, that's kind of all I have to say mostly about cookies. So I can talk a little bit about um, just some more baking tips for the holidays. Uh, we were talking before everyone joined about um, uh, baking as well and how it's kind of the pitfalls of um, just baking all year round, which is um, something I wrote about in January of last year, so wow, almost a year now, um, was kind of how um, when it comes to baking, um, a lot of the recipes that you'll find um, in LA Times, food magazines and cookbooks, uh, you know, the people who are uh, making these recipes, they, you know, are usually professionals who have a lot of experience. And so they have their own way of measuring ingredients. And, you know, I found this out, you know, from my experience, I've worked at Food Network, um, lots of different uh, magazines, now at the LA Times and all these other places in between where everywhere I would go to work, everyone would have their own way of measuring flour. And some people, you know, the standard for the test kitchen was to call for scooping it and leveling it with a flat knife. So you get a flat uh, surface. Some was to take a spoon and spoon flour into a measuring cup, then level it off. Um, some believed in taking the flour or uh, the measuring cup, kind of fluffing the flour in a big canister and then kind of leveling it off. But, you know, I think in, in I always see this and I was you know saying, everyone has this, you know, unique way of measuring flour, but it's never really communicated to the reader. And so, uh, you know, everywhere I went, you would always get uh, emails and people commenting on baked goods never worked out for them because they were too dry or, you know, mostly it was too dry. I think it was because the people were compacting the flour too much. They were using too much flour because uh, I think most people uh, measure flour, at least what I've seen whenever I've gone to people's homes. And I've kind of, you know, um, stand, stood in the back to see what really happens when no one uh, knows what's, who's watching. And I will see people, you know, open the flour bag take their flour cup and they just kind of jam it in, uh, press it up against the side as it's coming out. And then that's what they use for their, to measure their flour. And that, and I knew that that is how no recipe is developed for flour to be measured that way. And that's something very unique to American or US baking recipes that we always call for volume measurements, but they're very inaccurate in that way. And so one of the things I wrote about this past year was, you know, finally, you know, weight uh, scales have been around for years and, um, you know, they are relatively cheap compared to, you know, a stand mixer, even a hand mixer, all these other pieces of equipment that I think a lot of people buy to, you know, be good at baking. But then whenever, um, you know, someone says you should use a scale, people are like, oh, it's too, it's, you know, it's too expensive or I can't find that. Meanwhile, they're very common. They're very cheap. Um, and that is a single you know, tool that I think will help your baking succeed most because, when you know how much uh, the flour or your, your baking greens are supposed to weigh, it doesn't matter how you, you know, scoop them or measure them, as long as the weight is correct, then you'll have a baked good that works out perfectly every time. Um, and so I called for using a scale in all of our baking uh, recipes. And since then we have listed um, the grams, which is the most accurate way to measure and is in every uh, scale you can buy now has grams and ounces um, and even volume measures, which I don't understand how that works um, for a weight, but they have those things built in. And so we call for grams first, then ounces, and then the volume measure. And that way, um, you know, we're telling you that, you know, if you're making this cake and it keeps coming out too dry, now you see what the, the weight of the flour should be. If you go by that, you will have the same results because you can't not. And I will say since then, I've had zero emails this whole year about uh, baked goods not working out for people. So I think, um, you know, if you're looking for a good gift to give someone this year um, for Christmas and they like to bake and cook, even if you like to cook, period, a scale is great because you can weigh, you know, meat for, you know, portions of people. Um, you know, there's nothing, I use my scale every single day. I have a, I have an OXO brand scale. I think it's the 22 pound um, one. I think it costs 
$60 on their website, maybe cheaper on Amazon. Um, but I would say buy that for someone you know and love, buy it for yourself, give scales to everyone because that will improve your baking. Again, more than anything else, you'll never need anything other tool other than that. Um, um, I would say buy a scale even before a stand mixer or a hand mixer, you know, use your hands to mix if, if, it, if it means, uh, you know, using the money elsewhere to get a scale. That's my biggest, biggest thing to say. Um, also, one of the cookie recipes I did this year was a, a fudge recipe, which, uh, as Christine said before, I was born and raised in Mississippi, so I'm very, um, uh, I, I used to make fudge a lot and like kind of candies for the holidays. And so you would always need a candy thermometer to make those things. And so for this fudge, uh, you know, you have to cook the sugar to a certain degree to get it to work out. And um, after I had a few people email me to say that, you know, they tried to make the fudge and it didn't work out, I, I knew immediately it was the candy thermometer. And I said, you know, you know, is your candy thermometer old? Is it brand new? Um, you know, maybe try it again with the brand new candy thermometer, see what happens. And then it all worked out. And so, and this is something that I have come across in my experience, but again, it's kind of hard to put into a recipe because like, why are you going to put this randomly in there? Or maybe I'll write about it one day is that a lot of candy thermometers, every candy thermometer I've came, I've come across, no matter what the brand is, no matter how expensive or cheap it is, they usually last about two or three uses and they, they go bad. I don't know if the, the mercury breaks or something's wrong is happening, but they, um, they, something goes off and they don't work anymore. So I actually buy a new candy thermometer probably every one or two times I use one. I know this seems very wasteful, but it is a way to ensure that things work out for me. So I always keep new candy thermometers. So I would say if you're looking at a recipe, it calls for one, you want to make candy this year or something. I don't care if you're, your candy thermometer is brand new. If it's been seen every 10 years, buy a new one just because it's better to uh, spend the money on that than have to rebuy all of your ingredients or have, you know, try to make this um, candy for your holidays and it, it doesn't work out and that's really disappointing. So I don't want that for you. So do that for sure. Um, and then another kind of um, tip, and this kind of goes back to the cookies uh, before is that I like to use um, a lot of candy in um, holiday baking as well. Um, you know, I did a cookie this year, it calls for uh, licorice and almond paste and it was a really strange combination. I thought it tastes really good. Um, I think a lot of people are like, I'm not making that. However, um, I use candy in it because I think that, you know, using peppermints, using Hershey Kisses, using M&Ms, any, any kind of candy, that always makes um, a cookie really fun. It kind of, um, I think, makes it easier for a lot of people just because, um, you know, it's, it's a nice mix in. Um, it's usually accessible at most grocery stores. Um, and it kind of, it, it makes cookies kind of um, not feel too too fancy. And again, I think the really simple things, um, the sugar cookie type things, they go really well with um, kind of using candy mix-ins and it makes for a more enjoyable experience all around for most people, I would say, um, when it comes to um, kind of holiday baking, what they, what they really want at the end of the day, whether it's a gift from you or to give to someone else. Um, so that is, I think, I think most of the kind of, um, kind of tips and things I wanted to talk to everyone about. So I'd be um, very interested to know um, if we have time and questions, um, what your questions are for me and what you kind of want to know that I didn't answer, if I did answer it, you know, anything else I can elaborate more on. Thank you so much, Ben, for all your yeah. wonderful hints to um, help us with our holiday baking. And um, several people have said that they regularly read the LA Times and they look forward oh, to your um, <laughs> section um, in the Times, the food section. And um, they're also, I know you talked about plant-based cookies, but they're yep. um, looking for main dishes. And I know you talked yep. about vegetables, you yep. know, as a large mushroom, but whether or not you have a, a dish, a casserole dish. Um, you know, I don't, because again, like I think whenever I need a plant-based um, kind of main dish, I usually, you know, the most meat substitute thing I'll do is tofu. Um, and I use some kind of like stir fry, um, or some kind of like really nice, like saucy thing. Um, I usually roast, you know, big vegetables and make some kind of like really flavorful sauce to go with it. Um, I would say, I mean, I think most casseroles you can make if you're looking for something in that vein um, are pretty, um, you know, they use 
eggs. I think most vegetarians do that. Um, so you can use eggs in that way and do lots of vegetables, um, lots of spinach and things like that um, into like a potato casserole or some kind of situation if you want kind of a, um, a kind of a hearty main dish. I think a vegetable lasagna is also a go-to of mine. Um, I use a lot of mushrooms, a lot of spinach. Um, or if you want to use like roasted vegetables like Brussels sprouts and broccoli and cauliflower, I just like roast them first, then use them and kind of layer them with, you know, the cheese and the noodles um, in the sauce. Um, also, I think that's a very easy thing to make vegan as well uh, because noodles are usually already that way. And then you can use, I mean, there are like amazing cheese substitutes that I see in grocery stores these days, even at my Albertsons um, that are vegan that you can use um, as substitutes for that. They kind of give you that kind of a creamy mozzarella a feeling and vibe, you know, for, uh, you know, for what you're doing. So maybe vegetable lasagna is what I would, what I would do for now. Yeah. If, if not okay. a big, you know, cauliflower head. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. So then uh, the yeah. question was, is that they um, love your biscuits and um, they go put them, I need to go directly from the freezer to the oven. So they haven't defrosted them. So you said that, that you can actually yep. just take them from the freezer, put them in the oven you said suggested them for breakfast and do you think yeah. it's better to brush buttermilk or butter on them before baking so um i'll answer the uh, both parts i think so uh, biscuits going straight from the freezer um is probably the best way because just like pie crust and things uh the colder it is when it goes into the oven and the shorter amount of time that it has to kind of like thaw out the better so it goes from really cold to really hot it kind of will lift and make for a flakier thing so that's why i always uh, I make biscuits and pie crust, stick it in the freezer. Also what my mom did when I was growing up and it always turned out well. And then that way you can you know, make two, you can make 20 and they bake uh, better, I think, from the freezer. Um, I think that maybe brushing butter is the best way. Um, again, because that's something you're gonna have around. Um, you know, when I was growing up, we would just bake the biscuits without anything on them. And then when they came out of the oven, uh, my dad would take a stick of butter, unwrap half of it, and then just kind of hold it upside down and just kind of rub it over the top of all the biscuits so you get the melted butter but you don't have to cut anything off and then you just rewrap and stick the half melted butter stick back in the refrigerator so you can do that um but yeah i think um i i you know it's one of the things i see a lot of people a lot of my peers whenever they try to make biscuits really fancy and very like whatever they use egg washes and cream and all the stuff and it's one of those things that to me a biscuit is a very humble thing it's kind of like a dinner roll where it doesn't it doesn't need it and there's so much butter in it already that I just make it plain and then, you know, split it open and eat it with jam or syrup or, you know, you can brush it with butter afterwards if you need to, but I don't think it needs it. It's a very kind of humble thing, but um, if you need to brush something, I would use butter. Yep. So you talked about your dad and what he did with the butter. So how did you yep. get interested in cooking? Did you have a, a grandmother or did you just get a cookbook out as a child? And <laughs> what did you do with I, it's, it's very much a family thing. My uh, grandmother on my dad's side, she was very much that like stereotypical Southern grandmother where you know, every Sunday after church, we would go to her house for lunch and she would have fried chicken or a ham. She would make biscuits. She would have cornbread. She would make uh, turnip greens, collard greens. Uh, she would have... Um, onions and tomato like big slices of raw each from her garden uh, just on a platter um she would have layer cakes that her uh, neighbor made because she did not like to make layer cakes and maybe some like field peas like black eyed peas as well so it was all that stuff and that was every sunday she should make all this food um and then my mom and her sister uh, my aunt they're big bakers uh, she used to run a, a catering company and so they just um you know, we would have pound cake or pecan pie or cookies every weekend. I was, you know, I ate a lot when I was a kid. So you know, we would have, it was just a big cooking and baking family for sure. So I think that's, that's what it was. I, I enjoyed doing it. And so I figured why not make this my occupation? <laughs> well, good for you. I mean, yeah. you're excellent at it. So thank you. you have all of this wonderful background. It's always nice to know how everybody gets going. It usually comes yeah. from somebody's family. And so yeah. you have all these wonderful family recipes. Absolutely. Do. So Someone wants to know, do you have a suggestion on what bruschetta would be great to buy as an appetizer dip? Oh, okay. Um, I mean, I love, honestly, my favorite thing, and I've made this often over the past year, especially in the summertime, but I think it's just as great in the wintertime is um, roasted peppers. Um, I will, uh, you know, I have a gas stove, so I'll take, you know, 
red, orange, yellow bell peppers, blacken them over the flame with my tongs, just kind of rotating them until they're fully black and kind of soft. Um, take the peels off, uh, just kind of tear the um, peppers into like bite-sized strips with my hands. And then I put them in a um, kind of a baking dish and I'll layer them. I'll put, you know, a layer of uh, roasted peppers. Um, and obviously you can buy some really nice ones from the deli counter at the grocery store or just buy the roasted ones from a jar. Um, I just rinse them off, dry them, tear them. I put a layer of that. I do um, capers that have been kind of rinsed as well. I'll do um, anchovies if you like anchovies, if you don't. Um, you probably don't like sardines either. Um, maybe just leave them out. Um, I do a little uh, anchovies and then drizzle a really good olive oil, drizzle some red wine vinegar. I just keep going, keep building like in a dish. Um, and then usually by the end, everything's kind of like neck deep in vinegar and oil um, and it has capers as well. So you can kind of fork those onto bread. I think that's really good. Um, you know, tapenade is always great. Um, I think if you're going to make pesto, I Personally, I like to make my own only because I find the store-bought stuff can taste a little bitter sometimes, but um, I think pesto is so easy to make on your own. So if you have any, um, I love using non-basil uh, versions of pesto. So any, if I have parsley or cilantro, I have spinach, if I have watercress, any kind of uh, lettuce like that that's left over, make a pesto with that because it's kind of, it's still that kind of dark green flavor. It's not, obviously it's not going to taste like basil, but um, you mix any of those kind of green herbs with enough cheese and either pine nuts or almonds and olive oil, it's going to taste good. So I always like to use what I already have um, to make a uh, pesto like that, for sure. Great. Thank you so much. So of course. someone wants to know, when trying a new cake recipe, and um, sometimes it's difficult to know exactly when it's done. Mm. So you, you put the little piece of straw in it or you put your knife in yeah. it. Um, yeah. and so that's just really, do you do it in the middle or do you do it on the edge or do you take it out just before you think it's done or what's your secret? Great question. Great question. Um, so I, I mean, I bought a, it's basically a thin piece of wire that has a tab on the end of it. It's a, a cake tester from, um, a Teco, A T E C O, which is like a cake, um, manufa equipment manufacturing company. Um, so I have one of those and that's what I use. You can use, um, a raw piece of spaghetti. You can use a toothpick, you can use a wooden skewer, anything like that. Um, I don't like to use a knife only because it's it's really wide. I, I want the thinnest um, hole possible to be poking into the cake because I want it to not be damaged. Um, always go for the very center because that's going to be the last thing, especially in a round pan. You know, the heat's coming from the outside, so it's going to be the last thing to cook. So if you go right in the very center and it comes out and it's clean, then you know you're good to go. Also, always look for the sides of the cake. As soon as the cake is done and it has... Um, you know, there's no more moisture left inside. That's when the edges are going to start kind of coming inwards just a little bit. So if the cake is, and you might have seen this in some cookbook um, recipe writing, when the cake, when the uh, yeah, the cake starts to pull away, they would say that from the sides of the pan. That's when you know it's done because at that point it's starting to dry out because because there's no more moisture left to evaporate. So um, you don't want you know the edges to come too far in. But yeah, I think if no crumbs or no batter comes out on that stick. And you see that the cake is kind of just starting to pull away from the sides of the pan, you're good. Um, I think if you're making something in a butt cake pan, you want to go again in the center um, most part of the cake. So you have the wall and you have the funnel. So you want to go in the middle right here. So in between the funnel or the, you know, the middle tunnel and the wall. Um, if you're doing a loaf cake, again, the center of that as well. Um, always aim for the center for whatever, whatever's baking and you should be fine. Great, thank you so much for those tips. So talk a little bit about an air fryer. Um, it, well, I have one of um, Tiffany that works with me at the library, actually was able to cook a lot of her Thanksgiving dinner in, in the yeah. air fryer when the oven went out. So yeah. for us that maybe not know what an air fryer is or because the recipes in your cookbook are absolutely fabulous that you can do. Oh, thank you. Fryer. Thank maybe, you. maybe you don't need an oven anymore. I mean, you know, I, I, there are some baking recipes in that air fryer book that I think that work really well and you can do that. Um, so an air fryer is basically, I think it was invented to be like a replacement for deep frying. You know, you don't use oil, but I actually found that what it actually is, when you, when you take away the name of it, what people use it for, is it's actually just a very small convection oven. 
Um, and I think most people nowadays, um, I don't have this because I live in an apartment, but if you have, uh, if you've had to buy your own oven in the past 20 years, it comes with a convection setting. And that is basically just your normal oven, but with a fan at the back. So it kind of moves the hot air around the food faster. Um, and that's used a lot in uh, restaurants. A lot of baked goods you get in restaurants are used in a convection oven. It makes things brown um, better. It makes them cook faster. They get bigger rises because you have all this air moving. So an air fryer is literally just a small countertop version of a convection oven. And so all the recipes that I developed for that book, I developed them with that mindset. It's like, okay, I want something. If I, if I wanted to bake something in my oven, but now I have the capacity to you know, cook it at a higher heat with this like rapid air moving around it. And it's going to like brown bread, it's going to cook faster. What are things that I can make in that, that will um, benefit from that, from that use? Um, and so that's kind of the things that I made in the air fryer. Um, you know, you can do, you know, fries, you can do chicken wings, things like that if you want to. But I think uh, the best things that it's used for is actually making uh, roast vegetables. Because if you think about when you're roasting vegetables in an oven, you, you know, you toss them with oil, put them on a baking sheet, and you put them in the oven, but it takes 40 to 45 minutes usually. To, uh, and you have to like keep flipping them over and over again to ensure that you know, the parts that are touching get brown, but then you get you know, the moisture off the rest of it. And the vegetables usually end up getting, it's hard to get them cooked. So they're really crusty on the outside, but done on the inside um, in the right amount of time. Usually they're too soft or whatever, they kind of burn on the edges. And I think the, um, the air fryer is a great solve for that because you can put a few in the air fryer. It cooks at a really high heat, but it also cooks through and it gets really nice and caramelized. Um, and it's great, great, great for if you're cooking for yourself or just one other person, if you don't have a lot of people to feed. I think if you're trying to feed a large group, like four to six people, stick with the oven. But if it's just you and one other person, um, it's the best thing. I use it oftentimes now when I'm making dinner, I'll usually be, you know, cooking a piece of fish on in a skillet while I have some broccoli or Brussels sprouts or eggplant or something like that roasting in the air fryer and then making a pot of rice on the side. So it's kind of like you're a helper in the kitchen to get something going, especially if, um, you know, it's not really a problem right now because it's cold outside, but in the summertime, you don't want to turn your oven on, use the air fryer because it doesn't heat up your kitchen. So there are, um, there are pluses to it um, and lots of different varieties, but it's a small oven. It's like your toaster oven, but you can cook things really fast and much hotter and better. So it's a good way to think about it. Oh, thank you. Because there's lots of things. You, the cover of it has wonderful shrimp. That yeah. You have <laughs> you can do anything in it. Yeah. Anything in it. Absolutely <laughs> wonderful. So, so you talked about um, your cookbooks. But how, what pans do you recommend? I mean, oh, okay. So are we looking for the silver stone? Are we looking for copper pans? Or what are we? What should we look for? What do you recommend? Um, and like like basics for to get started yeah. out with, like what you use every day. Um, right. I would say, so I have a set of all clad pans. Uh, one's like, you know, uh, probably like an eight quart large saucepan. There's like a four quart kind of medium one and then a two quart kind of smaller one. Those three pans I use uh, every week, if not almost daily um, for everything. Um, I have, and I, you know, I think probably I mean, Allclad is a more expensive brand, but I've had them now for God, 12 years. Um, I think they were like $220 for the set, you know, back back then. Um, and they'll last till the day I die. So I, it, it's, it's a worthwhile investment to get good solid pans. They don't warp um, and they're they're well-made. I'm usually very much against buying any kind of pan from uh, the grocery store, like Walmart, those kind of things, just because they're just not usually very well-made. Um, especially like nonstick skillets and things like that. Although I will keep a really cheap, small nonstick skillet around just to make eggs only in for breakfast sometimes. Um, Cause those usually last for about two or three months. And then the kind of the coating kind of wears away but then you can throw it away but I just use it for eggs alone, nothing else. Um, I would say uh, a good cast iron skillet is really great. Um, I use mine again, probably once every two weeks um, to make biscuits, to make cornbread. If you're someone who makes that kind of stuff, it's great for searing meat. If you make a lot of steaks and things like that, um, it's also a great uh, vessel for roasting you know, your vegetables in or anything like that, um, or smaller pieces of meat. So I love that. And then I also use, I have a, I think it's probably like a 12 quart, so it's a little bit bigger um, Dutch oven, like a Lake Rousseau Dutch oven. Um, again, I know they're really expensive, but 
it's really worth i've cooked so many things in it and like braised things boiled pasta you know made soups like i use it all the time um and i think as long as you take care of it they'll again will last you for the rest of your life so those are the things that i use most often to cook with um you know then we can we can get into knives and things like that too but those are pans that i would say um i use the most and every day and i think that everyone needs probably don't need much of anything else oh and you do need um baking pans but i get the really kind of like 20 dollar chicago metallic um rimmed baking sheets you can get online for like you know i guess 20 dollars from like a restaurant supply store buy those i would say do not buy the william sonoma like kind of gold you know um finished ones that they sell they're expensive and they they warp get the really cheap like aluminum chicago metallic ones from a restaurant supply store get like three or four of them and you're good to go they're great i use them for everything so do you recommend going to these um cooking supply stores I do. I mean, I, I'm very much a um, function over form person. So I don't really, I don't really care how much things look. Uh, I just want them to work really well. So I use, I use metal bowls for all my prep. I don't really have nice, you know, ceramic or glass. I have some glass bowls, but um, I don't keep things around because they look nice. I want them to work really well. So I have um, a set of graduated um, metal prep bowls. One that's like this big to like that big. Um, so you can mix everything in them. I use um, oxo whisks for most things just because they work really well um yeah the baking sheets from the restaurant supplies houses they're the cheapest ones you can bake cookies on them you can roast vegetables on them i roast um you know my turkey on it uh everything you can do in this in this pan um and so anything that you're going to use for a variety of different um applications i think is and you know cheap to a point of um that it's worth it, not so cheap that it falls apart. But these things last, so I, I would say definitely go there for sure. Thank you very much. So yeah. someone's asked a question and I'm not sure that I'm understanding it correctly. Um, how do cake bands or maybe it's cake um, brands work to keep the cake flat on the bottom? Or um, so <laughs> is there, do you have a special, if we wanna buy a cake, a ready-made cake like Duncan Hines or Betty Crocker, is there-, is okay. there particularly like best? Um, you know, no, I don't know. I think I go with Duncan Hines maybe. I don't, I, I often, the only thing I usually buy that's from a mix is a brownie mix because my partner enjoys box brownies. Don't even ask me, I can't, um, I can't change his mind. So I usually get the Duncan Hines uh, box brownies because I found those are the best ones of uh, the store-bought um, store mixes. I have not used, uh box cake mix in a long time <laughs> unsurprisingly um but you know i think i think they all are great for what they do um yeah and i you know i'm i'm, I'm fully for um if that's what that is going to be the gateway into just getting someone to bake and getting someone into the idea of it and into the love of doing it i say go for it yeah. okay so someone has a convection toaster oven would it oh. work as well as an air fryer it is the same thing. Um, I think, you know, as long as the surface area that, so most air fryers, they are a basket kind of shape and you, you know, it's kind of round and you put it in, it kind of goes all around it. Then there are air fryers that are also convection toaster ovens that are like the square flat um, that you kind of, it looks almost like it's shaped like a box, like a regular oven. Um, those work just as well. Uh, you can actually do more in them because you have a bigger surface area. Um, but yeah, you can do the exact same thing in there as well it's the same thing so if you you have all these wonderful cookbooks behind you and maybe you've got mm -hmm. maybe more than 300 or 500 yeah. or whatever <laughs> but if you could have just one cookbook what, what would you get the joy of cooking you know that's come out or you're going to get um julia mm -hmm. child because she's from pasadena and oh, that's right she is that's right have any of you've come to the pasadena library and as you know, our central library is closed right now because the seismic retrofit, but our branches yeah. have a spectacular collection of cookbooks. Um, so what if you could just have one, what would what would you recommend people to start out with? Oh, to start out with? Oh. Just, just um, one well, if you want just one cookbook, you know, there's the New York Times is a good cookbook. 
I don't think the LA Times has a cookbook. I'm not familiar with uh, it. They do. They haven't, they haven't done one in a long time, but there's one from like 1870 that they did. So it, this has been a long time. Okay, 1870? We need to, we oh. need to like re, we need to re, uh, re update to a new issue. Um, I would say, I mean, to start out, that is, that's a great question. I don't know if I have an answer for that one. Um, I would say probably the joy of cooking or some kind of super basic cookbook is really good. Um, my favorite book, though, the one that I would probably take with me to my grave is the prune cookbook it's a um oh. you can see there's a grease spot on it from where i've used it um <laughs> it's a restaurant in new york that i would go to all the time and um gabrielle hamilton her uh she's a chef of it and she, she wrote this book it's very unfriendly to uh, anyone who's never worked in a restaurant because it looks like a restaurant menu there's no um or restaurant um, cookbook there is no table of contents there is no way to find anything it's just like you have to flip through constantly but her food is really good and that I cooked from this as you can see from all the tabs um, quite a lot it's a lot of um, very acidic very salty meats and like uh, roast vegetables and things like that um, and it's it's all food that you know you eat at a restaurant but you can make it home it's very impressive but also very simple so that's probably the book that I would um, Saving a Burning Fire. Um, there's also, I would say, let's see. I don't know if anyone knows this book, but it's a classic that I really love. It's um, Home Desserts by Richard Sachs. I think it came out in like 1993, but it is very thick as you can see. And it is basically like a um, encyclopedia of every dessert in America um, from, you know, from like a hundred years. And so he kind of gives you an example of every single thing you could possibly find in America. Um, that's a very good um, classic book, I would say, if you're into baking, for sure. Um, the Chez Panisse Desserts book is also, I turn to that a lot when it comes to baking. Um, and then just a regular cooking manual. That's a great question. I don't know if I have just like a basic cooking manual. Um, I would say, you know, if you do want a book of the moment or, a couple of years ago, salt, fat, acid, heat is really good. And that's a good kind of uh, cooking uh, general starting out um, manual. And then, yeah. Um, yeah, I guess I would go with those three. I know you asked for one, but I gave you three because it's really hard to pick. <laughs> and then your cookbooks as well. Absolutely. And my cookbooks as well, but you know, I'm not going to say that. I got to, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, thank you very much. So you've given of us course. some wonderful um, tips of what to do and what to have, um, how to yep. measure, what pans to buy, what um, to buy as far as flour, and yep. a hint about um, vanilla, which is just shocking how expensive that is. Yes, very. <laughs> and find the substitute for everything and just kind yep. of explore and see if it does or doesn't work out. Yeah, kind exactly. Of, kind of, so um, thank you very much. We really, really appreciate your time and effort for the Pasadena Library. Let's see if there are any other questions. Well, I don't see any other questions. And Ben, I thank you very, very much. And um, you've indicated that people do write to you. Um, they yes. send you an, e an email and yep. you respond. And I can't thank you enough for saying yes to the Pasadena Public Library. And I wish everybody in attendance a very happy um, holiday season. and. Lots of enjoyment with your cooking. Yes. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Yeah. Good night. Bye. Bye. Bye.